Morning guys, just uh, carry on with part 3 of this review of the GPZ 550. This is one of my little collection and uh, as the other videos show. I've done a fair bit of work on this one. Uh, so what I'd like to cover in this one basically is a dynamic review, not so much of mechanical specifics or anything like that. It's more about actually what it's like to ride and the overall performance of it I suppose. Um, Taken the context of course, although this is a 1991 machine, they are very heavily based on a design set back in the 70s really. So it's really important to remember that although it looks fairly, well fairly 90s I suppose you call it, slash late 80s, we are talking 40 year old technology if not 50 really. So it's really important to take that into context. We are out in the New Forest this morning. And uh, it's a lovely morning actually. Really, really nice. So let's carry on with this and we'll give you a few little specifics. So if we start with the front end then. Um, these single piston sliding calipers. And I'll say sliding in inverted commas. They're only sliding when they are really well maintained. These are uh, freshly rebuilt. Uh, the pistons are absolutely fine, no problem at all with those. They're cleaned up really well, so it's obviously fresh seals and the and those Kyoto pads. Uh, this brake was shared with the whole GPZ range from the 550 slash 400 because they're exactly the same minus the engine, well the balls more specifically, uh, right up to the 1100. And they must have really struggled on the 1100 to be honest. Um, single you know if, if, if you're up on your own not two up so just a solo rider they hold their own I suppose they're okay two up they really really struggle I've uh, covered 4,000 miles on this now and admittedly not much of it's been two up but certainly taking consideration the age of the bike when you try and compare it against modern machines well there really isn't much comparison to be honest um, they do suffer a little bit the anti-dive um, Again, this is all fully rebuilt. This is as good as it gets, really. New seals all the way through. Fully flushed, flushed through. Obviously, fresh fork coil and uh, the forks are fully rebuilt as well. Although the anti dive itself runs off the brake fluid, um, which is again obviously fresh. It's one of those things that sort of started in the 80s and thankfully didn't really go much beyond that. It doesn't really give you any great benefit that I can feel even when they're turned right up to maximum settings I mean it's, it's not like it stops it from diving at all there is a marginal difference there but you need to take into context it will only work on the brakes because they're activated from a little piston which when you pull the uh, the brake lever in the brake pressure pushes down on the piston which basically closes the valve and the fork the idea being is that it adds damping which yeah it does um, but we aren't talking there's no dive at all I mean, you can get the forks to top out um, or bottom out more accurately um, even with two or three fingers uh, the forks themselves uh, these are the air forks um, the air damping forks they are linked on some of the earlier 400s and the earlier 550s they're separate so you've got two valves on these it's just the one valve and it links both forks together um, there's a little link pipe which you might be able to see just in there and if you run about three or four psi it's about right on these um i've tried taking it up to 10, 10 psi and it makes the front end uh very non-compliant and it's really not pleasant to ride like that so the manual says you can run them right down to sort of one or two psi you can run them without air in them but it feels like you're riding uh, an old pogo stick from the 70s it's Two or three psi is, is all you need in those, and they're they're fairly good. Um, they are very skinny forks. I mean, compared to modern bikes, they look a bit like a bit like pencils, I suppose. And again, take it into context. If you really pushed it, I suppose you could overwhelm the forks, but you're taking it out of context with that one. Um, these are as good as new forks. It's got fully new uh, guides, bushes, seals, all Kawasaki. Uh, genuine products so these are as effectively brand new forks how they would have been from new um, and again comparing against modern bikes there really isn't a comparison they are very easily uh, taken to their limits especially when you're two up um, 
things like the electrics, I mean these front indicators are actually rear indicators off my ZXR 750 which when I took the fairing off I decided they were uh, Kawasaki parts and actually look quite good I think obviously no fairings are a controversial point um, the electrics generally speaking really reliable they are very very basic on these electrics although it's got a Battlestar Galactica type dash uh, the electrics are very very basic which I guess makes them reliable although contradicting exactly what I said uh, the only problem I have had in this for 4,000 miles is the left hand switch gear um, effectively the earth side of that switch gear completely burnt out it was impossible to resolder it every time we soldered it it just went dry uh, the solder didn't take um, which is a shame but again you know she is 40 years old that's to be expected really now the star thing of this bike, I think of all the GPZ slash Z range, um, is this eight valve engine. It is so simple. Two valves a cylinder, obviously. The cam chain runs in the middle on these, which is common with the old air cooled engines. So changing the cam chain can be a bit of a pig. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't do it. I mean, with 40,000 miles on it, it's got a new tensioner in there. The chain itself is is absolutely fine. There's no need to change it. The sort of that sort of mileage. As you can see the head gasket's weeping a tiny bit now. Um, that's my fault to be honest with you. I did go out a few weeks ago when we still had some warmth and I wasn't drawing it to its max potential. Um, mainly to see what it would do really. You know, I'm a relatively experienced rider. I've been riding for, for 30, 35 odd years now. I have done a little bit of racing. Um, again given that sort of thing up really last few years but I did decide to push it fairly hard and to be honest it's a fantastic engine um, hasn't got a lot of character I wouldn't say it's a massive power band anywhere or anything like that although once you get it past 7000 it does start to uh, to really pull well really pull for 65 horsepower I suppose you'd say um, carburation on these now these are the Cahin carbs CV carbs run the standard airbox um, Every time the tank comes off on this bike, which is not that often to be honest now, I do balance the carbs and they are absolutely spot on the carbs. I think that's a really key thing with these older bikes. Um, keep the carbs balanced up. And they run remarkably well. When I took it for MOT, um, the mechanic there is ex-Kawasaki and said this is one of the best running ones he's ever heard. And it, It's not difficult to keep them well tuned to be honest with you just keep those carbs really well balanced and you won't have too many problems with them it starts like like a modern bike just tap the button off she goes and the engine you can't kill these engines um, they will go on from hundreds of thousands of miles they really are incredibly simple you can get all the parts available from it. it's really not a problem at all I do the oil and filter every 4000 um, although because of the exhaust you do have to drop the exhaust off to get the oil filter out on these one, it's a JAMA system. Um, but it's four into two, so it's not a big problem to be honest. I mean it takes what fifteen minutes I suppose. Um again standard airbox, standard air filter, which is the best way to run these. I know people do things like put pods on there. I do fully understand the reason why. Because getting the airbox back on is an absolute pig, it's it's a horrible job. But changing the air field so you just raise the back of the tank a bit it's dead easy um rear suspension yeah it has some <laughs> that's about all i can say about it um this has got oil on bushes all the way through the linkage let's just show you the linkage there um if you can quite see it under there it is a standard shock and it's got 40 odd thousand miles on it now uh it feels like 400,000 to be honest the shock is is not brilliant um, well it's crap to be honest the rear shock it's just not worth investing in uh, rebuilding the shock when the bank allows I'll probably just uh, stick a hay gun or something in there the rear shock is, is pretty awful um, has got preload adjustable behind the side panel uh, and a variable, com variable compression which well, I've tried either end of the adjustment it doesn't make a lot of difference to be honest and at that mileage and at that age you really can't hold that against it um, it's done by a little wheel on the bottom of the shock not sure if you can see it in there 
and it's got six settings or something from marginal difference to no difference. Rear brake, yeah, it's exactly the same caliper as the front to be honest. It looks the casting's slightly different, but in all other things other than the casting, it is an identical caliper. Um, when you buy the rebuild kits, you just buy exactly the same one to be honest. So, really simple. Rear brakes, I mean, yeah, not bad actually. Um, mainly because it's got a really, really long brake pedal more than anything else, which gives you some decent leverage on it. There you are, mountain bikes up in the forest, lovely morning. Morning, guys. Yeah, it's a lovely day today. So, in terms of reliability, I've covered what, just over 4,000 miles on this now, I suppose. Yeah, just over 4,000 miles on this. Uh, touch wood. Reliability has been nearly total. The only issue I had was that earth side on the uh, left hand switch gear because it includes the clutch cut out. Every time you turn left it would cut out, which was it was fun just to say, you know, trying to come home from Portsmouth as I was that day, about 30 miles from where I live. You can't really keep turning right all the time. Uh, it does take a very long time to get home doing that. So it's just a matter of uh, leaning rather than using the bowels, if that makes sense. And we got home with a few little stops. Um, what else can we say about it? The gearbox is absolutely spot on. Um, as long as you're reasonably slow with it, you can do clutchless shifts up and down. I have tried it. Yes, it will do it, but you know we're talking 40-year-old tech here, guys. It's, it's not a it's not a Moto GP bike. Um, as long as you're slow with it and deliberate, it is a spot-on gearbox. It never drops out. Uh, selection's easy, neutral's easy to find. You can be um, fairly quick up and down the gears, as fast as your foot will move, if you know what I mean. And she won't miss. Um, you can come down from third or second at two or three miles an hour, and it's really not an issue at all. Or you can change up at the red and she'll snick straight in. It's a lovely little gearbox to be honest and um, definitely feels like it could handle twice the power um, which again it makes about 60 horsepower so wrapping it up how does it compare to modern bikes um, it doesn't to be honest with you I mean it is very clearly 40 years old when you ride it the tyres are very skinny um, well one thing we will say about that this modern fuel so I have tried E5 E10 in terms of performance, I can't feel a difference. I've had no issues at all, and I've run E5 and E10. Um, E5 being super and E10 being normal unleaded. Small mountain bikers. Morning, guys. Um, yeah, E10. I can't feel any issues with it. Uh, starts okay, doesn't run hot, doesn't run cold. I've had no issues at all. Um, apparently, E10 absorbs water. I use this fairly regularly, I suppose, a couple of times a week, and again, I've not experienced any problems with it, so long term we'll find out, but early indications are no difference um, in terms of economy. You're probably talking 65 miles to the gallon anyway, so if there is a difference, it's marginal. But going back to the point I, uh, I diverted from, can you compare it to a modern bike? No, no, you can't really. Um, it is a 40 year old design if you took something out that's modern styled. One of the new Z900 RSs is just in a different league. Although that 650 does look quite interesting. I suppose it's similar sort of power and the vein is similar of the bike I suppose. But in terms of dynamic performance there isn't a comparison. Um, but just to, to roll around on a nice Sunday like today. You know it's about 10-12 degrees today. It's really pleasurable to take your time on it. Roll around on it. Um, you know it's going to be reliable because there's basically nothing to go wrong with it. Um, as long as you don't try and keep up with sort of, you know modern sports bikes, and that, it's clearly not going to do it. But just to roll around, it's a nice little usable classic. It's absolutely lovely. I mean, she will sit at 80, 85 very comfortably. Standard gearing on this, I don't see the point in changing it too much because it doesn't make any difference in terms of real world usability. Unless you're trying to achieve something like a slightly lower RPM when you're cruising or if you find the gearing a bit too tall around town which this doesn't the gearing is absolutely perfect on it it pulls up to nearly the red in top and it would go down to below walking speed in first and second so we'll call that a small victory on the gearing 
Um, value wise, yeah, I mean you can pick these up for, if you can find them, 1500 quid I suppose for a reasonable one. A tidy one like this which has had a lot of work on it because of the crazy bike prices at the moment. If I was going to sell it I'd want nearly two and a half for it. Um, is it worth that? Well it depends what's got a value to you I suppose. Can you buy a better inverted commas bike for two and a half grand? You could certainly buy a more modern one, that's, that's true. Um, you get a nice CBR 600 for that, which is, again, I know, a completely different context, but just talking about comparators in the sector, really. Um, most of these older bikes are long gone, unfortunately, now, which is a shame. So it seems to be more the cool factor people are after, and I wouldn't know much about cool being 42 years old. That's a thing of the past. Um, but, yeah, it's a lovely little thing. And if you're after an everyday bike all year round, winter, summer, two up, touring, sporty days out you know playing on the back roads it's not a bad choice i suppose just take into account that it's 40 years old in design but i really love owning it and it's really lovely it's a good looking bike it's nice to own it does get a lot of attention um mainly because you don't see many around now in terms of everyday usability there's no reason why not i mean back in the early 80s and things and late 80s when i first hit the road these were really uh well respected bike and I can see why but taking it into account against modern counterparts it, it's it's a different time it's, it's a different time you know you're comparing at least 30 year old if not 40 year advancing technology um, one thing that I think has not been improved since these bikes is fueling to keep those carbs balanced keep them really really I know I keep saying it keep them as well balanced as you can run a standard air box and a standard air filter a standard exhaust as you can reasonably get uh, keep the throttle cables nicely tensioned up keep them well lubricated and these will fuel as close as you can ever get to perfect I mean you can put the throttle on the stop two and a half thousand rpm doesn't cough doesn't splutter just takes its time once the revs get up it becomes really sensitive it's a really easy bike to ride it's not challenging in any way it's not it's not instant, it's really smooth, um, it's a very safe bike to ride because it's not going to surprise you in any way, it's not going to suddenly rip your arms out of sockets with the merest hint of a bump in the road. I do know exactly what that's like as a cross tourer owner, that would be my next set of reviews by the way, it's going to be on my cross tourer, the VFR 1200X, um, I've got a well, brand new last year, so 2020 model. And if anyone knows about twitchy throttles, trust me, it's us cross tour owners. Um, twitchy is not the word I would use. You even look at the throttle on the front end, it's it's picking up. Um, and I'll be honest, it's a real issue with the cross tourer. If I was going to move on from it, that would be the reason why. But we'll we'll come on to that later on in the in the cross tour reviews. But in summary, then, guys, it's a lovely little classic. If you can get hold of one, they're a lot of fun to own in terms of garage maintenance. Um, <laughs> very very little again usual stuff plugs every 8,000 miles I do mainly because the cost and the benefits of doing it that way oil and filter every 4,000 air filter just blow it out every once in a while uh, parts cost us hilariously cheap I mean a full service on this with modern oil um, you're probably talking 40 quid and it is very 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 doable even by um, very inexperienced hands and I class myself as fairly experienced having rebuilt many bikes over the years including engine rebuilds and in terms of maintenance this is definitely something you could do yourself unless you are uh, relatively inexperienced with servicing bikes it's very ownable if, that, if that's even a word there is literally no need to put this into a professional in terms of routine servicing it's all very very achievable I think sadly that's something that's gone from modern bikes is these older ones you could own yourself I mean pick up a Haynes manual on eBay for a couple of quid I've got a genuine Kawasaki one which came from Canada ironically and that cost me 12 quid it's a genuine Kawasaki manual and it tells you everything you need to know and many things you don't need to know in terms of everyday ownership um, and this is about as simple as a bike gets to own I mean in theory if you were that kind of owner which I'm not you could leave it for many years and it would just run and run and run and run and run um, again valve clearances I mean it's so long in between valve clearances it's not really a factor I'd say do it once if you rebuild the, rebuild the engine 
and then the sort of mileage you're probably going to do on it. You're talking many, many years until then you're doing again. Um, early signs of valves on these is they get hard starting when they're hot, rough idle. Um, you can sometimes see a difference in the colour in the exhaust, but that's if the valves go out by an extreme amount, which is extremely unusual. Um, again, bucket and shim on these takes a cans out job. But in terms of maintenance, it is as simple as it gets. Reliability as good as it gets. Cost of ownership. I, I pay £78 a year insurance on this. It's not on a um, multi-bike policy, because to be honest, to put it on a multi-bike policy it would cost more than it would to have its own insurance. I guess there's some benefits of getting old. That's a fully comprehensive policy. Everything's covered. Um, that's on 6,000 miles a year, I think, which I won't never realistically get near, but I've done 4,000 this year on it. I want to say £78 a year insurance, fully comp. I mean, that's as close to free as you're ever going to get. So there you go, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this little series. Um, you might see me flying around the New Forest or generally out and about on this one. I do use it a lot. I'm not frightened to use it. It's, it's not a garage queen, as you can see. When I rebuilt it, it was supposed to be used. It wasn't supposed to be sat in the garage just to say, hey, I've got this cool old bike. Um, I might do the occasional other video. I wonder if I've got some plans to take it around Wales later on next year, if I still own it by then. Um, doesn't seem to be too much on the old YouTube about the GPZ 550, other than people trying to thrash them and blow them up and try and say they're race bikes because they're not. Um, I thought you'd appreciate this more kind of owner type review really. So there you go, I hope you've enjoyed it, do keep watching the videos, uh, as I say next one in the series is going to be my VFR 1200X Cross Tourer, fair bit to say about that one, lots of positives, a um, couple of negatives, um, which we'll come on more to in that series because I'll start waffling about that otherwise. So there you guys, hope you've enjoyed it, um, keep rubber down. Enjoy the sunny weather while we got it. Enjoy the freedom while we got it. Take care of yourselves and we'll see you on the next one. Cheers then, guys.